hipsters game. Just remember that. Then. There's a small bit of a needle there. But come on, Mayo, you've got to get Andy Moran into the game. Listen, Mayo. We're doing something a little bit different this week. The pick of the final round of league games saw the two best teams in the country, Galway and Kerry, play each other and we sent men to watch it. We are going to work out what Galway are trying to do to fix whatever it was that left them short against Kerry in the All-Ireland final last year. We'll assess whether Kerry are on the way towards adequately replacing David Moran and we're going to look at a few surprising aspects that were revealed in yesterday's match. As well as looking at Galway uh, and Kerry, we're also going to look at the key promotion and relegation matches across all four divisions. We'll preview the league finals for next weekend and we will look at the reasons behind the return of Stephen Cluxton. You're very welcome to the Irish Examiner Gaelic Football Show. My name is Paul Rouse and I'm joined today by the former Mayo footballer and manager James Horn, by the recently retired Offaly footballer Johnny Maloney and by Morris Brosnan of the Irish Examiner. Morris, why did Galway beat Kerry yesterday? Uh, well, that's a good question to start. Um, I, I'd say three reasons. Basically, Paul, they had their most complete performance under Park Joyce, probably outside of the kind of final last year. The best man marking job that I've ever seen on David Clifford by Sean Kelly in terms of what he did defensively, but also on the ball. And they made the most of their possession. So they converted their chances. Their conversion was up at 70%. I think Kerry's was down near 50. If you do that, you'll generally be there, thereabouts. And they got a, a nice punch off the bench as well, which I'm sure we can talk about too. But yeah, systematically, it was the best, most complete performance, I would say, under Joyce Barr, maybe the, the game against Roscommon last year. And outside of that, they, they won a lot of their, their key matchups. So you, you, even though the gap was a little bit smaller than the goal, which was something of a fluke. You wouldn't put it down to the to the to the goal. You'd put it down to Galway being slightly better. Is that is that right? I I did think Galway were slightly better. Now on the flip side, Kerry absolutely have a case about the goal. If there's not Jack O'Connor certainly isn't thinking this today, but if it's not for two goalkeeping mistakes in this league, Kerry are in a league final. When you add in the the Shane Ryan one against Tyrone as well, um. So these games are often decided by by fine margins. But I did think I think Galway were definitely better. They as I mentioned, their conversion was brilliant. Their attack was, they were working the ball into really promising opportunities and taking their chances. Um, they got the, the David Clipper matchup spot on. That was an unbelievable job by Sean Kelly yesterday. He was just a Rolls Royce of a footballer. But beyond that, yeah, I thought God, I were, were slightly better. They were, they were full value for their win. Would you agree with those reasons, Johnny? Um, yeah, no, Paul, I would. Um, I agree, Mars. I thought even though the goal was maybe fortunate, um, Galway, I thought over the course of the game, uh, were the stronger team. Um, Sean Kelly, obviously, is uh, Morris Lula to there had an unbelievable game on David Clifford. Now helped out by the Galway system, like they were getting bodies back when they could, and they smothered uh, David Clifford several times. Uh, John Daly was, I think, he's a very effective centre back. Now, to be honest, if I was involved in a team, he's exactly what I'd like to see in a centre back and how he plays. Very intelligent, he cover back, gets back, cover space, and. I suppose from a carry point of view, you'd be a small bit concerned that David Clifford is kind of snuffed out like that, like the options uh, diminish after him, like they're uh, very reliant on him. It's obvious when you're there as well how reliant on him they are. Now, on the other side as well, David Clifford wasn't too far off having a, a very good game. Like he got a number of shots off, like um, on another day, some then go over. And I remember one the first half, Sean Kelly, yeah. who part of his part of his kind of plan on David Clifford was drive him up the field but Clifford didn't really follow him one time Sean Kelly actually got turned over the ball went back up to David Clifford and the clock and he got a shot off the crowd cheered for a point but it actually just went wide so if from my from what I saw like fine very fine margins and go away were just that bit better uh, yesterday uh, that turnover was interesting because it happened to go away a couple of times uh, and, and Kerry got after them yeah um, yeah especially in the first half I felt uh on the turnover, Kerry were very impressive in transition. Like their kicking game was very good, and they were really punishing Galway in turnovers. A number of times, um, when say like the build up was slow and Galway were kind of getting into kind of a set attack, um, when Galway had a turnover, they were wide open. Like, and I was just waiting for a goal to happen, and uh, it didn't. I think one stage they fluffed one was that uh, Paddy Clifford maybe dropped a ball, but Thomas Sullivan picked it over and chipped it over the bar. That that really should have been a goal. I remember another instance as well. Um, there was another turnover, and it was basically a foot race between Paddy Clifford and his direct man. A ball over the top, 
Bernard Power kind of came for then had to realize he wasn't going to get it, went back in, went ran back into the goal. It was another handy point. And in the second half, whatever Galway did, if, in fairness, to kind of shore that up. And uh, Galway might kind of say, Oh, we were turned over the ball too easy, but there's also you're going to turn over the ball during the game. There's also, I felt they left themselves a small bit over open on the turnover and maybe something for them to kind of look at in terms of maybe keeping that back door shut not, not being as um, vulnerable I suppose to, to turn over the, It was interesting you mentioned Bernie Power there and the goals uh, he had a very good game yesterday um, Yeah no I thought he was excellent uh, to be honest uh, thought he varied his kick outs really well he's very comfortable going short picking out either cornerback on kind of out onto the wide near, near the sideline um, he can go along as well. He can't maybe kick quite as long as Gleeson, but like he can still get it out there. Like in my view now, Park Joyce is a, a big decision to make in goals. Like from I, I who would you who would you games, pick? Who would you put in? I uh, I pick Bernard Power. Um, I don't think there's any from, from my point of view. I definitely would. Uh, Gleeson's a, a fine goalie, but it's kind of maybe a bit of um, he's made quite a few mistakes now under the high ball say, and then his kick out he's very good at getting out long. But in terms of short teams. Then go realistically are targeting that as well. Whereas I think, uh, I suppose, uh, power is far more comfortable uh, on the short kickouts. Um, I suppose that's probably maybe from playing with Cora Finn, uh, he probably has a bit more exposure to that kind of style of football. Um, and for me, he made a few, a number of excellent saves as well. Um, I thought he was really, really good. Like he, he's really given uh, Horrick Joyce um, something to think about in goals. What, what do you think of that, Morris? Who would you go with there? Bernard Power as well. I think it's a. I think it's a huge call for for Galway now. That's a great thing. To, all over the field now, Galway suddenly have options. The big criticism, and I mean, I I said it too of the All Ireland final last year was that they didn't have options in reserve. But now suddenly you've got. It'd be very interesting to see does Patrick Kelly get back into that forward line and who comes out if you don't like. I Carl Sweeney has been. He's probably a very kind of unheard of player, and we spoke about him here, Paul, after the Mayo game and the way he they failed to close out that game, epitomised by him. Since then, he's been such a versatile player for Galway. He's kicked great points against Tony Gall, and then he goes back and does a job on Paddy Clifford in as good as probably anybody in the field could have done yesterday. So you'd be very encouraged by that. Does, you can't really drop him. So where does Patrick Kelly come back in? Does Ian Burke back, get back into this team as well? That's another interesting one. So I think finally they have options. But yeah, on that particular call, I'd uh, I'd go for Bernie Power. And, and, and Cook and Maher around the middle are a big help. And the development, the further development of Matty Tierney, who I have to say... Matty Tierney, of all the, I saw a lot of Sigerson Cup football this year with being involved with UCD. And Matty Tierney is the best footballer that I saw in the Sigerson Cup this year. I thought he was absolutely outstanding. So, around the middle, Galway are very powerful now. They are. And not to go over all ground here, but the John Maher's story is, is remarkable. It's like this guy, this guy was not deemed good enough to be, and probably fairly, in a squad for the last two years. He, he made his debut against Mayo. We talked about this previously in 2020 when they were annihilated and you weren't sure if he was ever going to play for Galway again. And he So he wasn't exposed to a senior setup and comes back in and kicks two points against Kerry looking absolutely at home in Pierce Stadium. He had a brilliant impact against, he came on against Tyrone and Tume as well. It was great that day. And again, against Donegal a week later. But for him to, to be effectively parachuted in and look totally at ease is, is fairly remarkable. Peter Cook looks like he was never away. He is absolutely flying as well. Like they're, they're getting a huge lift off the players who've come in. Probably a, a more lift than they would have anticipated. So they, I, I think Galway, there's no team got more out of a league than Galway did because they made a league final, but they've unearthed a lot of exciting new prospects as well. Why do you think they lost the All-Ireland final last year? Their bench. They just didn't have enough. They, they had nothing to bring in. Or nothing, yeah. not enough to bring in, to be fair. Yeah, I thought they went stride for stride with Kerry for, you could say, maybe, maybe an hour, but with those last four points, Kerry rattled off. They're getting a big impact off their bench and Galway didn't have it. They were picking off the, by the end of it, their team was pretty predictable and they weren't getting the same impact off the bench. So yeah, I think they didn't have options in reserve. Now there's small things within that as well. It's Kerry, like Johnny mentioned it there, and I, I'm just looking at based off numbers and it's interesting that Johnny can just sense it based off field, but there's no team better in the country on turnovers than Kerry are. And they, they kind of echo Galway alive in that regard in the final last year. So that was, that was part of it too. But if you want to pick one nice shiny factor, it was, it was their bench and they've gone some way towards resolving that issue over the last couple of months. James, do you think uh, describing them as the two best teams in the country is, is unfair or fair? 
Um, oh, they're, they're up there, obviously. Um, I, I think Mayo's form in the league obviously has has them up there as well. And Tyrone are, are accelerating at a rate of knots that uh, it's coming there. And obviously, obviously Derry, but but certainly just on what the guys are saying there, um, Galway or poor Joyce has to be just licking his lips really at, at the moment how the league has gone. Um, and it, it, it's funny. You know, I heard him being interviewed yesterday after the game, and and you know they've unearthed a lot of new players. He had absolutely no choice. You, you know, if you look at the injury, the injury rates that 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 goal we had, and that was, that was that was the same. That's the same with a lot of counties. You know, um, sometimes when you have no choice, the best choice is no choice. You know, you you throw players on there, and it's it's, it's sort of sink or swim. So a lot of the new guys, and particularly defensively, um, how, how how some of the guys are playing for Galway, um, he he'll be delighted and. There's definitely something different about Galway. It, it's like um, there's an energy around them. Um, even the crowd yesterday, um, all that kind of stuff. It, it, to me, it's slightly different than what Galway beat teams have been over the last number of years. Like Galway a couple of years ago, ah, there, you, you know, there was all that going out to Pierce Stadium in a windy and play, playing that type of football, and there was all that sort of negative energy around them. Um, that that's definitely changed. Um, you know, you know the enthusiasm of the young guys that are coming in. You know the under twenty, the win on that. Some of the games last year, particularly against Armagh, all that kind of stuff has has Galway. You know, and the energy around them um, in, in in a very good place. And I, I, not to not to labour the Sean Kelly thing, but what a player in leader he is for them. Um, you know, when even yesterday, when the team needed something, or when it was, you know, Kerry were coming back. Go and just needed something. Just Sean Kelly just in, injected purpose um, into into the game and, and, and just let them out. So look, overall, you know, go with Jack, Jack on the other hand, I would say, you know, to, back to your question, two best teams. I, I I'd say that Jack is is definitely not a happy camper the, the, this morning. Yeah, there's a goal in it, and there was you, you know could have gone either way, but it, it's not necessarily the result that he's looking at. It's it's where's where's their improvement. Where's Galway's improve or Kerry's improvement since last year? What what's making them more of a threat in in, in potential threat in this year's um, championship? I, I I don't see any additional threat. If anything, you know at best, you know they seem to be just holding holding the line or maybe backwards a little bit. You, you know, Galway definitely improved. Mayo definitely improved. Um, I I don't know if Kerry have or have that influx of players. You know, you could list off a load of of Galway players that are playing well, and the new guys that are coming in. You know, Johnny McGrath, Dylan McHugh, Keen Hearn, and all these guys are bringing it, we're bringing energy and something to the team. I I'm not seeing that um, with, with with Kerry. So um, they, have, they have a lot of work to do. They have some time to do it, but 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 certainly they don't uh, play for a month. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? They don't play for a month, and in a month's time, they play Watford or uh, Tipperary, I think. It's the winners of all for Tipperary. They play in the yeah. Munster semi-final in a month. That's 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 means you're coming... They're, 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 we have to be realistic here and say they're going to win that match, judging by the form of Tipperary relegated from Division 3, Watford stuck at the bottom of Division 4, near the bottom of Division 4. So that's a Munster final against Cork or Clare or mm -hmm. Limerick in, in five to six weeks' time. It's coming relatively quickly. Yeah, and... I, I suppose if, you, if if I was to ask you who are the new players that we've seen throughout the league for Kerry that you, we think will make a real difference to their their panel come the serious end of the the All Ireland Championship, I suppose I, I that's where I'm and I don't know Sullivan a couple of them Roach has done pretty well, done okay, um, but, but you know Jim O'Connor coming back, Paul Ganey coming back, they're okay. We know we we know about them, but I suppose it's that new um, that you know those new players that that have that. That threat about them, just not seeing seeing that. So, so Jack has a has a lot of work. But if you haven't seen them at this stage in the league, are you going to get someone between league and championship um, outside? You know, returning injured players. I, I don't know if you are. So, so Jack has definitely a few a few a few things to think about. Were you talking to Jack after the game, Morris? Paul, someone tweeted us. That's a very productive question. Somebody tweeted us during the week that uh, you should be the host of the Late Late Show, or at least be a contender to take over as the host of the Late Late Show. Um, now you, <laughs> you you tried to pin That's James down. That's not helpful, Morris. Now, well, <laughs> um, 
uh, as you, I'm sure you know, I was. <laughs> um, your office you're referencing my my exchange with Jack. For people who don't know, just for context, after the, this game, I asked Jack about their long kickout. Uh, was it a concern that they only had one successful long kickout on the game? And uh, he asked me what exactly was I concerned about. And I tried to kind of when you're explaining, then you're losing. But I was trying to clarify the point they're trying to make. Right, you've got you're three... trying to be helpful, Morris. Right? You're <laughs> trying to be helpful. You've got to, in, in football, you've got there's three primary. So the reason that I would do this is because you're watching a lot of games and you're looking to the three primary sources of your scores. So you can score from a turnover, you can score in the opposition's kick out, or your own kick out. That's totally basic. Uh, as it happens, there's been a team throughout this league that Kerry don't score a lot after own kick out. So just for example, yesterday, Galway scored four points after own kick out in the first half alone. I think, you know, seven points that Kerry scored in total was on turnovers, but they scored four. In total, off their own kick out, and the others are on uh, Galway's. And that's been, Paul, you go back, like it's just one thing that I've noticed again and again and again. Teams are actually giving it up to Kerry short. So they gave it up to Armagh, gave everything up short, as we talked about. Armagh scored more on their kick out that day than uh, Kerry did. Kerry scored two points on their own kick out against Roscommon last week. Um, now they destroyed Ty- uh, Roscommon's kick out. They've got one of the best presses in, in Gaelic football. They, had, they scored 1 5 off Roscommon's kick out, but they only scored two points on their own. It was the same thing against Tyrone, as I talked about previously. It just so happens that I've brought this up twice ever, I think. And one time we two of the best managers in the 21st century, I me and Jim and James. And the other time I have a four-time All-Ireland winner ask me what has me concerned. <laughs> so maybe I'm, I'm barking up the wrong tree here, but it's definitely, it, it is a team. And I'm still kind of adamant that uh, it panned out yesterday as well. Yeah, but you're dealing in facts, aren't you? As, as you see them. Yeah, lies, damn lies and statistics, I suppose. The, the re- Johnny, the re- in your impression of the game, from what Morris saw from... From facts there, from your reading of the game, unstated, would you, would you, where would you stand on Morris's point? Uh, yeah, so when I was watching it, I was, I was just trying to take in as much as I could. The first few kickouts, Kerry went long and they actually got, uh, it looked dangerous actually. They won a few balls in behind and um, I felt after that goal, we kind of made a little tweak and they just they said, right, uh, we're going to actually give the ball to Kerry and let them work through us. And uh, from then on, just go we way more comfortable. Yeah, the game didn't feel as much on Kerry's terms like oh we were able to suppose from the kick out just get organised they all came outside the 45 gave it to Kerry and up to Kerry now to bring it the length of the field and to Morris's point uh, from that point on outside of the turnovers Galway looked really comfortable I felt they controlled the game uh, insofar as they could with and without the ball like so um, yeah I'd agree uh, I don't I didn't know those stats now but Kerry need to maybe look at maybe why that is. I don't know, is it an over-reliance on certain people transition the ball, certain people winning kick passes in certain positions, like in opposition, identifying that and getting tight in these key individuals and just making it real tough for them. Um, and then Galway has just been very organised. But at that level, all the teams that Kerry play are going to be seriously organised. You'd have to be... Kerry probably needs to do a lot, of, a lot of thinking on that because it's hard to see them win on All-Ireland with those stats. Yeah, and this uh, that's the bar, isn't it? It's it's the the, the bar is that all Ireland. Also, th- that's your is that your first time to see David Clifford uh, in the flesh? Uh, well, no, I, I I saw him actually. I was at one of the Mayo Dublin finals. And he played a minor uh, final against Galway, I think. So I saw him that day, and then that's my first time seeing him play for Kerry Seniors. Um, to be honest, uh, as far as I yeah, that is definitely the first time I saw him play in the flesh for Kerry Seniors, and. Um, yeah, I was looking forward to it now. Um, I think he's the best footballer in the country. Um, so just to see the battle with him and Sean Kelly now, it was worth the admission fee alone. Like, um, there's no step back from Sean Kelly now. He plays right on the edge and Clifford gives as, as good as he takes now as well. Um, but it was one of David Clifford's best games. But in, as I said already, as I mentioned already, he was a million miles off, uh, putting up yeah. a few, getting a few scores like and, and being the difference too. So... Uh, I don't think you could if you played if Gower played Kerry again. I don't think they could actually even dream that they'd have the same impact in terms of trying to take David Clifford out of the game. Like uh, I don't think, I don't think that will happen again. So, um, look, if, even that point alone, Kerry would be a bit better. Um, if the fixture had to be replayed again. Yeah, James. You know when you go to when you you know when you were managing Mayo when you were managing Mayo and you would go and watch other teams playing, you go to the ground. What exactly are you looking for? Is there anything in particular you're looking at? Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's an awful lot from going to a game. Um, 
that you that you can tell you, you know a lot of the performance stuff you, you know there's a lot of video review you can do you know but 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 around the game there's a huge amount that you what well, in my opinion that you can you, you can get you know like particularly league games because you can you know if you get position right you can you can hear and see a lot of the things that go on you know from the sideline right through to the to, to the player so so when we were doing that there was no flaw we'd, we'd 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 go through we'd firstly look through you know who's the energizers on the team who's the energizers on the sideline you know so who's who's doing the talking even in the warm-up you, you know who's or who's organizing it, what players are sort of leading it um you know to who on the sideline is doing what um, you know, even their body language, how they look, how they, how they, how they feel. So you, you, you look an awful lot or, or, or around that. Um, you know, you, you look at the management team, you know, who's on the sideline, who's doing the comms, who, who sort of gets agitated, who keeps their composure, who's the decision maker. Um, you, you know, again, you can tell a lot, of, a, lot, a lot from that, you know, just the, the hierarchy or how, how, how it works. And again, that might, that, that might give you some, some bit of information, but, but on the field as well, you know who's who's do, doing all the connections, like right? so. Who's holding the lines together? Who's holding the structure together? Who's who's doing the conversations? Who who likes to keep their position? Who you know who shout at the guy in front of him to go or to stay or to hold or or or, or, or whatever it is. So you know, there's an awful lot of information like that you can you can get. You know, how do they react after there's a scenario in the game? You know, who's again jumping up and down on the sideline? So there's there's an awful lot of little things that that can can help and can support i suppose your prep for a game you know for example if there's a player that likes to stay in structures you know and, and is doing all the organizing how can you maybe pull him or drag him out of a position that he does you, you know that he doesn't want to move from and then what does that do to others that might impact the rest of, of, of what the team does so there's a no there's an awful lot how they react to the crowd you, you, you know or what the crowd do um you know when there's an event in the game so you're just you're just sort of analyzing that sort of information to see is there some some angle or some edge that you can use in your prep or, or, or the language that you use in your messaging during the week and the lead up to the game. Um, so, so there's a, there's an awful lot you get from, from, from being there that you, you wouldn't necessarily pick up um, just watching it, watch it on, on TV. Do you know what was interesting, James? Yesterday, uh, Jack, the stat just it happens in Pierce Stadium, the, the layout of that stadium, the stats box is right beside the press box in the stand. And for the first half, Jack O'Connor sat up in the stands mm. beside uh, Paddy Talley. And um, it, was just, it happened to be right alongside me and their two analysts, JC O'Shea and uh, Colin Trainer. Um, I'd say the two boys were delighted to see my happy head staring over, looking to see what software and hardware they were using. Um, uh, but yeah, for the first half, he spent it entirely beside Paddy yeah. Talley looking at structure. I went down then towards the end of the deck and stayed down for the rest of the half. Yeah, yeah Morris, there, there's a thing about it. When you're in the press box, is there much chat? Amongst the, amongst the reporters, there's loads of chat, yeah, um, and you have to be careful of that too, Paul, because it can it can influence your opinion of what's going on. Or um, I I would much rather grounds if I can sit closer to analysts, I tend to do it. It's just a, a trick of the trade. You'll pick up on even small stuff if you can overhear. Not that I would use it in, in copy or anything, but if you can hear overhear small stuff, small messages, it'll give you a good indicator of something happening in the game. I'll give you an example. I did a league game earlier this year, and I heard somebody shouting on a mic. It's all down the right hand side. Everything is down the right hand side, and uh, I remember thinking, "What is he? What is he after seeing there?" So I went back and watched the game back, and when I was uh, tagging it or doing analysis, suddenly I realised that a, a wing back had four assists. And now this is a guy who can spot that live in the moment, which is I'm very jealous of of that eye. But yeah, you'll you'll pick up on small stuff that maybe unheard of stuff if you're if you're sitting close to there. So I would much rather sit as close to the the stats box than the press box as possible. Johnny, you played basically a dozen years for Offaly. Did you, did you ever go and watch in the flesh players who you were going to be playing against? Um, it be very, it was very difficult to to do that part because you're normally playing obviously the same the same day or the same weekend. Just logistically, actually going to see them play in the flesh is um, probably probably not possible. So you'd be would be reliant on analysts or whatever to. To give you clips or whatever, but from an awfully point of view, unfortunately, that probably only happened in the last few years. Believe it, believe it not, that it actually got that we got actually to the level where we were getting that kind of information. And before that, like the odd fellow was sent to the game and he'd go back with an A4 pad, kind of photocopied and handed out to you. This lad likes his left foot. He goes out and the first ball he gets, he spins it over with the right. And um, so I suppose, yeah, you, you like you get to, you, 
the, the analysis packs the intercounty teams get this year are, 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 are not this year, but these days now are, are like a very, you know, you, you will get a good feel for who you're marking. But like uh, in saying that, like I, sometimes I think it was Chris McCaig or something I heard him saying, like he when he gets the, sometimes you just get the clips and you might just get a clip of a lad receiving the ball and turning kicking over the bar but you no know, context to the score like was it off of a turnover was it from a kick out like what was his movement like before that so in terms of actually going to watch it live is a huge advantage like if you can so the more you get to see these players and how they move like especially if you can go to a match and you can afford to kind of maybe zone in on one particular fella I think the learnings from that are unbelievable that like a video unlikely to ever give you the the same kind of experience unless maybe you get the kind of the, the view from behind the goal as well as the, as the standard view that you normally would get you'd have to look at both of them and the time in that uh, time that would be involved in that as well would be significantly more so like going live definitely is the way to go like if you if you can at all because you can see so much you can see what you want off the ball off the camera you know Johnny, did did um did, did mr mohan change all that was he the guy that uh <laughs> well, up, up um, the whole thing uh, to, to be fair, when uh, when John came in, yeah, we started we started to to get that kind of information before that, and just trying to think. It was probably the year before that when Stephen Wallace was there. To be fair to him and uh, Billy Sheaton, they were getting us um, proper proper clips on teams. So that was 2018. So you can imagine before that, we uh, like I mean zero, absolutely nothing. Like uh, it was it's madness. Like you know, and then you know, from an awfully point of view and teams lower down like that. I'm sure we weren't the only team like and then we're trying to go out and be the best that we yeah. can be when we're already hamstrung like we, we don't I'm not saying we're going out trying to win all Ireland's or Leinster championships but we want to be the best versions of ourselves say sure. and when you're going out in hindsight looking back like and you're thinking sure what were we even we yeah. no hope like we didn't have a so, chance and, so listen and tell us what, 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 what was it like um, under Mr. Mohan? I'm fascinated to know how did you find it? <laughs> well, I know I got on I got on great with John. You know, uh, to be honest, he's, he's a good, great old character. As you should know yourself. Um, I actually had him with Sigerson in NUIG years ago, so oh, okay. I knew him from then. And then he took uh, Offaly for four years, and look, he he made me uh, captain there on my final year with Offaly, and uh, something I was very proud to do uh, for myself and my family and that. So. And uh, no, I got on great with John. He, I suppose, when he came in, he kind of came in in fairly low ebb. And uh, Paul Rose was a lot of Paul Rose was after taking us there, and things were in bad way. Yeah, and then John came in really to try yeah, an impact. Like, job manager bounces easy after Paul. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only way it was up, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, no, John came in and looked the first year. I think we actually beat Sligo down in Clooney to stay in Division Three and then. Um, I suppose from then he kind of steadied the ship. I suppose he got us to Division Two, and if I'm being honest now, last year we would have been desperately disappointed um, not to stay up. I remember actually, um, I was uh, I thought like it's sad to say now, but I was chatting Liam Kearns uh, obviously during the winter there, and he, he even rang me, <laughs> or even up to a month ago, like because uh, he Liam had great plans for next year. But he was saying, "Geez, I was looking back at all your Division Two games last year. How did he not stay up? You know." Yeah. So it was. Uh, it was disappointing now that we couldn't have consolidated Division Two because um, for the likes of us who's, who's trying to build, uh, for Offaly who's trying to build, like uh, seeing that progress is what players want to see. And if you have progress, you avoid the player turnover, which I suppose is the ultimate kind of uh, thing that kills all the teams in lower divisions. It's, it's player turnover, like like all the top teams. I'd nearly be able to name your Mayo panel, James. You know, I'd know all the players. Very similar every year. A few new faces, but in the main, like the same players. Um, yeah. Same with all the Division One teams. Monaghan, yeah. case in point, I suppose. Yeah, we have to talk about Monaghan. Um, Monaghan's success in staying up again, James. How how, how did they do it? Gee, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to happen this year. Now, um, you, you know the way they started the league, but but look, they they have a lot, they have a lot of good players. Those Vinnie, v- v- Vinnie Curry, you know, even the way they sort of celebrated yesterday, you can see they're a tight bunch. Um, um, they have Conor McManus still. Um, we, you know, we talked about that guy a few shows back, and and um, what 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 a player, you know, what what a player to have on a on a day like that, you know, where you, you need to bring out a win. Um, but they're a robust team, Paul. That that you know, there's a. There's an honesty about them, and as I said, that sprinkling a good player. You know, you, you you know, you go through their team. They're decent players. They they won't. They, they've never had the biggest panel in the world, and have have, have struggled with that over, over over the years. But 
Um, you know, in a dog in a dog fight, in a dog fight, you know, um, and look at their their season pros at it now at this stage, aren't they? Um, yeah, you know, fifth year in a row. But look, it's not where you want you want to be. You know, you're in 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 Division One when you're on the edge from from really game one. You know, you lose your first game or your your second game, you have no points on the board. It's 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 a very hard environment. Then it's not. A, I would say it's not a learning environment. It's not a really strong coaching environment because you're doing everything each week just to make sure you try and get a win at the weekend. You know, so that development of players or development of a system or, or, or whatever it is takes a back seat, you know, till you try and lock in. So it's not it's not ideal. No, they get a you, you get a jump obviously after, after saying up, but it's not ideal throughout the, the, the seven or eight weeks of the league um to, to, to develop a team. But look, they're they're in there. Um and they'll be and what about our man James what what about their what, what about our man? I think again we've talked about our man and I just I don't understand them I think is the term I used with there two weeks ago um they're it, it that's a bad it's a bad relegation it, it it really is you know um you know from where they were last year and what they were doing looking to achieve and it, you know some of the half performances they put in throughout the campaign you know they've had they've had you know periods or 20 minutes or you know you know you take that mail game you know the last 15 minutes, 20 minutes or whatever it was and the performance they did. But I, I think they hamstrung themselves with over, over analysis um, um, of their structure and their shape and what they should be doing. You know, you go back to the game against Kerry and like, okay, people don't said, you know, I remember reading the analysis that, oh, I understand why they went so defensive. I don't. You, you got you to gotta set yourself up, yeah, to, to, to mind the house, but try and win the game. And I'm not sure they were doing that correctly or getting that that balance right so i say i think they got themselves in a knot and, and and ultimately you know got got relegated so um not sure what you know how long if it's a nick in, in the quad you, you know that's that can be a period of time to, to get to get reno neil back and, and and get him then when you get him back there's return to play and there's return to performance you know how 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 good he'll be and when he when he'll be back to to himself so not, not, not good. And the energy round at a, a, you know, a relegation like that won't won't be won't be strong either. You, you know, so um, yeah, a few few headaches there for for Arma. But I just think they need to, yeah, have a known structure for themselves, but free themselves up a bit to 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 basically have a better structure in their attack. Um, I think I, I don't think they have that balance right. And it, to, to me, now look at I'm only looking at it from the outside. It doesn't look clear to them. What exactly they're 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 trying to do, or how they're trying to win 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 that game? Yeah, um, and and there is the role of 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 their goalkeeping and how they go about that in 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 the game seems to be interesting, and the increasing prominence of 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 the goalkeeper in the attack as it being as against it being an add on in the past. Next weekend, James Galway Galway Mayo, how big of a game is that in the longer term? As obviously it's a big game in itself, it's a league final, but in the longer term. How important is it? Yeah, and just for that, the, the Ethan Rafferty thing. Um, I'm not sure. I'd be interested in the guy's thoughts on that. I'm not convinced how beneficial that is. I I don't know, Morris. Have you data on that? That the you, you know, look at it, Ethan got a goal, or whatever. But you know, what's the return or what's the benefits? What's the you know, if you analyze that in the cold with with, with cold data, what actually is the return on that versus what it does the team and as regards how they need to set up when the goalie does go out, etc., and who covers back and all that kind of stuff. So I, I'm just I'm still unconvinced by that. Um, it, it it leaves it still leaves certain defenders vulnerable or or they're not sure. So while like, while Ethan might come out and be strong on the ball and it looks this new creative approach to to attack, and I'm still not convinced it's something that's hugely beneficial when you're setting up so defensively organized you know so you don't concede is there not still significant risk with the goalie coming doing that that often um that frequently in in in, in games I, I i just not convinced it's it's all bells and whistles like like a lot of people think it is right so no anyway that's that's something maybe we can yeah. i don't know maris go on you're dying to but like not to go like too inside baseball here, but there's um there's a, a package, a couple of 
into college teams that use uh, a, a, an analytical palette is it basically it ranks every single player's possession and how impactful it is based off your, the score. So what it does, like, it's just very basically here, right? You would you would rate every player's possession. It could be, you know, it could be something like a link play, a positive, negative is obviously a turnover, mm-hmm. or whatever. And at the very end of it, you would see the outcome of each score. So you could see, in a, a sense, if you look at it over a season, you can see the pluses or minus. You can see. How if a pair passes through Paul Rouse's hands? How much likely are we to score versus if it passes through Johnny? Almost Moore's certain, Morris. Almost <clears> certain. <throat> <laughs> and you can see you get a, a fairly good ra- ranking. And as it happens, when the ball passes through Eaton Rafferty's hands, so say let's say for example, I'll tell you, like Johnny Heaney r- ranks so highly on this. That's like if yeah. for whatever reason, everything if the ball Johnny passes Heaney at centre forward, by the way, is a huge step by Galway, and it's yeah. it's really improved their attack. Brilliant, yeah, brilliant. We, player. Brilliant, we can come brilliant. back to that, yeah. But if the ball passed through Johnny Team's hands, Galway are much more likely to score. If the ball passed through Ethan Rafferty's hands, as it happens, they are more likely to, to score versus when it doesn't. Now, on the flip side of that, though, uh, I watched this game. I came home last night and watched this game back um, because I have nothing better to be doing. And uh, I thought um, I thought that Arma, the penny dropped. I, I, I have to say, I thought Armagh finally started to move towards a, a much better setup. As it happens, Rafferty wasn't as involved yesterday. Mm. Um, their attack was way better. Connor Turbot took over for the freeze and did pretty well. The, from the very first moment, he catches the, that mark out in front. Now, I, I kind of wish he took on Mac and me and the offensive mark didn't exist, but I'm sure there's a broader conversation there. I, I really thought that the penny dropped last. Uh, Philly McMahon was on co commentary. Uh, was this on BBC? Philly, uh, yeah, it was. Sorry, Thomas Lindock was the commentator. Philly McMahon was on co commentary and he mentioned our man's warm up. The whole thing was. Uh, Stupy Campbell was standing out in the wing, cutting in off onto his left and off his right. So I was curious to see how that would work out. And didn't he go and kick five points? So I, I thought yesterday, yeah. for, for for sixty minutes, they were like they were right there, they were level. Now I, we can talk about this if we have to, but uh, I thought Aaron McKay was blessed, absolutely blessed, not to be sent off. I, those shoulders, but if you catch a fella high like that, I think it's that's a stonewall red card. But besides that, I thought Armand were, were really good. Like that was the best performance bar the. Maybe the last half hour against Mayo that I've seen this year. Now, why did it take seven rounds for that yeah. to drop? I, I would wonder. And uh, why couldn't you kick a ball? I said Reno Neal was sitting in the stand looking at the ball Conor Turbot was getting in the first half there, wondering why why can I not do that? But but isn't the, that Mars, that's 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 interesting. Isn't that something to analyze? Like why was their attack and play maybe so much stronger without Reno Neal there? And the positioning and how they played yeah. with 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 Reno Neal. Reno Neal's a brilliant, brilliant player. Would not influence in the games <clears throat> enough or as much as he should be with, with with the ability that he has. So so that's that's definitely something that, that will add to their armor as well. Um when they when when they figure out how how best to utilize him. Yeah, we have to talk about Dublin, but we 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 are talking obviously about Stephen Cluxton. Dublin won yesterday, and well, but we have to start with Stephen Cluxton. James why is this after happening? Wow. Well, um, well, there's when you bring someone back in like this, right? What's your what's your gut reaction? Yeah, yeah. When you it, heard it, Stephen it, Cluxton was back in there, um, I got more WhatsApp photos. You know that photo of Mormon Rock? I got more WhatsApp <laughs> photos. I didn't know what was going on. I thought he, geez, there's something serious happened to Cluxton or something, but. But um, um, it's funny you go straight through it. I, I I don't know. Maybe it's just a manager for 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 so long. Wow, because there's pros and cons to every decision you make like that to bring someone back in. Even though it's Stephen Cluxton, there's still pros and cons to it. So um, you you got to weigh up how 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 many pros there is, how positive beefy is as, as a team. But I'm um I'm not surprised. I think. Dublin in Division Two, and you even saw it in yesterday in yesterday's game against Slough. They they look vulnerable in the in defence. They look a bit um, unsure. Um, so they're cry, they're crying out for leadership. Right? They're they're absolutely crying out. James McCarthy is coming and coming strong strong with it. But you know, Michael sounds a brilliant brilliant player. Just looks like he needs a bit of support, and I, I think Stephen Cluxton around will certainly, certainly help a lot of those, uh, a, a lot of those players, or provide confidence or, or give leadership. So I think, I think, you know, he's been captain for how many years? He's won how many All Irelands? He's been the best goalkeeper in the history of the game. Um, Second best. And, 
Second best, second best. Yeah, we can get Martin that. Furlong. Martin Furlong. Yeah, yeah, the best yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I actually knew that was going. Right, yeah. Right, yeah, first ever goalkeeper to win footballer of the year. Yeah, three All Ireland's with Offaly, which is about like that's like winning about fourteen with Dublin. Like that's okay. this. We, we, we we'll move on. We can do a James full podcast on. on that, Paul, in in, in the future. When, yeah, when the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My fifteen Offaly heroes, Johnny. Yeah. Don't worry, you you'll be on the bench. You'll be fine. Um. So, so look, he, he's a he's a real leader. You know, you like. You hear players, or you, you pick up, I suppose, over over time, what what the players in the dressing room think of him, and you know he's sort of a Johnny Sexton type, Roy Keane type of figure now, in a very different demeanor now. But but that that authority that they have uh, around the dressing room. So look, huge huge positives from that side, you know, no question. And like as a manager, I'm I'm I, I'm I assume. That Desi would have gone to the the James McCarthy's and the senior players and sat down. Look, here's what, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Um, here's the reasons why, and and get some of those players' feedback. Um, you know, before he'd make the decision. I assume that would have happened. So so there's there's a there's a there's a, gr- there's a group there that know what's happening and it it, it helps. You know, Wells, um, Stephen Clarkson back in back into the culture. But there is going to be players, and it might necessarily just be the goalies. That won't be fully happy with that decision. It's just the nature of of, yeah, of sport. No matter how good Stephen Gluckson is, there's guys that have put in a load of work, load of time, load of effort. Think they're making progress, all that kind of thing. And then you see this guy coming in, and you know, okay, if you're one of the goalies, you're thinking, what the hell do I? You know, what's going on here? Going back to a 41 year old, and you, you, all that goes through through your head. Um, so there, there is, there is. Ne- negatives to it um, that you got away with. But but when you stand back and from from where we are and you look at it, I, I it, it does make perfect sense um, that that a guy of his leadership capabilities, I'd say, goes in there because I think it's exactly what Dublin need. Johnny, do you agree? Um, when I saw this, it was halftime of the Galway Kerry game. I, I actually started laughing. <laughs> I was loud nearly. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Like. Um, I didn't know what to think. I didn't understand. First of all, I, I presume it's he's coming in because they have ever come for its long term injury. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, his long term injury uh, unlikely to play this year. So if David O'Hannon, who's been playing really, really well, uh, goes down. That they have Cluxton there um, to come in. But listening to I think Desi Farrell was saying that Stephen will probably want to play. So straight away, um, David O'Hannon's going to be looking over his shoulder. So he's going to be unsteady. So now there's a bit of indecision. Um, with David O'Hanlon, you'd have to think. Um, Cluxton, they're on about. I was listening to, I was driving back home from the game, Kerry and Galway, and I was in the car and I was listening off the ball. And Joe Malloy and Paddy Andrews were talking. Obviously, Paddy Andrews had a bit of the gaff there where he didn't even know that Cluxton was out warming up and until Joe Malloy pointed out to him in studio. But uh, Paddy Andrews was saying that it'll be brilliant for the standards or and all this. Um, you know, the standards he'll drive the team on, you know, very important. And, and Joe Malloy's making the point when the summer comes, you know, and the press is on the kickouts, Cluxton's and the man. And I was kind of thinking, do you need, like, Brian Fenton has, I don't know how many All Ireland's, how many footballers a year. Kilkenny is an unbelievable leader. Anytime he's needed, he stands up, kicks a, few, a score when it's needed, gets on the ball, unbelievable leader. James McCarthy, one of the best players I've, I've ever seen play. For all time, uh, yeah. Jack, Jack McCaffrey's on the team. Mike Fitzsimons is eight All Ireland medals. Like, are these boys not? Are their standards not high enough? Like I'm sure they are. Like you get me. I think it's kind of a thing that's just thrown out there. Like uh, there's no way that them boys don't have unbelievable standards that they need Cluxton to come in and drive the standards. That Cluxton passed that kind of on to them, in my view. So I assume why you might, might and I could be not even think this. I assume that Cluxton they, they they're they're unsure of their second goalie. Clearly, the third goalie is it Michael Shields. I'm not sure is he injured as well, or if he's not, like I don't know, he'd be hanging and around. The under twenties goalie is injured. And the under twenties goalie, like I'm sure basically Desi's kind of thinking, look, if anything happens to David O'Hanlon, I need someone really reliable. And he put in the call to Cluxton. Cluxton being Cluxton, like when he was needed and he knew he was needed, he'd come in. It's not about Stephen Cluxton, I'm sure, one hundred percent. Like it's about Dublin football and what's best for them. So but they've made that decision. They think it's best for them. So uh, we'll see how it pans out, but, but, but to me, John, it's it's more of a, a personnel issue rather than standards and all that sort of thing. But John, there's Johnny. I don't know what your thoughts on this. There, there's there's no way, and I think Desi alluded to this. There's no way um, Stephen Cluxton will come back in just to just to be a number two. It goes against everything that he 
he sort of was or or or, or is as a yeah. player, you, you know. He, no, like, I, I, and and then, I, then if you do, if he does come back in and he is sitting on the bench or even number three or whatever it is, he won't be happy. He will not be happy with that. So he could be, he could possibly be a negative in, no, in the place. And, as and this, is, this is the complexities of all this. Like as you said at the start, every decision, you know, you have to give something to get something. Like do you know what I mean? So. These are the complexities now Desi Farrell has to deal with. Like, and what's it saying about the future? Like, he's 41. Oh, like, he's not going to be the goalie in four, three or four mm-hmm. years. Or even is he next year? Like, he he'd get injured. Like, I'm 32 now, and I've noticed like recovery and all that. As as much as you try, you're going to pick up little knocks. Like, I know he's a goalie, but like he is 41 years of age. Like, time waits for no man. Like, uh, what is this saying about Dublin, especially in the goalie situation going forward? Like, are they thinking? It nearly could send out a message that, like, yeah. this is the last hurrah. We're going for this one. And then after that, if we get another one, I don't know, yeah. will we? Like, well, we're definitely going to go for this one. We're bringing in clubs and everyone ba- getting the band back together. Yeah. And, yeah. And, we're, and we're going for it. Like, so I don't know. The messaging to me is look, and it could work out. Dublin have unbelievable players. Like, I mentioned a lot there. I didn't even, I didn't even mention Conor Callahan, who isn't playing unbelievable, isn't playing as, his, yeah. to his best. But, but if he does hit form, like, another outrageous footballer like I think Dave Clifford's the best next best is probably Conor Gallaghan like so like I don't know it's it's very unusual I think um, I think it has to be I, I can't I wouldn't understand why if you're comfortable with your goalies David Hannan's playing well and your number two you're happy with him why you bring Cooks and back in like last year Evan Comerford didn't win the All-Ireland but nothing got to do with Evan Comerford played really well they had no it, huge issues on, on their kickouts like it's where Dublin never conceded the kick out when Cluxton was in goals. Like, um, uh, you know, Evan Comfort did really well. So, um, I don't know. It's it's a very unusual one. It'd be very interesting to see how it pans out. Like, but but to your point, I think yeah, Cluxton will be looking to play, and I won't be surprised if he is come championship. James, I have a question for you. Um, would you bring Lee Keegan back into the Mayo panel? Um. Ah, uh, no, no. no. No, <laughs> yeah, um, he's too busy training for the marathon at the moment. He's training for a marathon. I, I see him running around Westport, he's an absolute madman. He just can't stop running. It's just <laughs> even though he's, he's retired from the county, he's still running. Um, um, so I don't think Mayo will win the All Ireland as things stand. I think well, if Mayo, I don't think Mayo will win the All Ireland as things stand. I think if you put Lee Keegan back into that panel, then Mayo's chances of winning the All Ireland increase significantly yeah look again knowing the character like, I, I just the easiest thing of the lot would have been not to let him go i mean build a build a build a wall there and just just not let him not let him out of there um that that would have been the easiest thing but but he thought long and hard about it you know so look a lot of it is the, the player and where he is in his life and that kind of stuff you know but but you sort of know as a, as a manager guys that you you would or really want to come back or there's something that's that's impacted them from coming back. So if you can help them with that, you know, you get them back. But look, Lee, Lee, Lee Keegan, like the season he had last year, you know, playing cornerback and still running the, you know, create more opportunities from 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 cornerback, I'd say, than any cornerback last, last last season. So he's still he's he he he's still um he can still play into county football. Um but <clears throat> it's 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 whether the player has if if the attitude is there. And that's what makes Lee so great is his attitude. So so if if he if he if there's a part of them that really just wanted to to call it a day, then you'd you'd leave you'd leave it at that, and you'd pick that from the conversation. I wouldn't so. leave. I would no. I, I I wouldn't leave it at that. I'll tell I'll tell you why. He, you have Connor Loftus doing a fine job in that six role, the way they're playing him. Lee Keegan coming into that position, fifteen minutes left in various matches, particularly at the business end of the championship, in a season where the Sam Maguire is going to group stages, three week three games on the bounce into a quarterfinal, semi-final and final six games in basically eight weeks or thereabouts. That's that you need a squad for that. And I know Mayo's squad is very strong and I know that sort of Lee Keegan immediately improves that squad. Yeah. Yeah. But again, there's, this, you can look at it that way. Absolutely. And I, I, I think it would, but look at how Jack Coyne, look at how into Hessian have their development has accelerated this year. If Lee, if Lee was there, they wouldn't have got as much game time. You know, so maybe there's two players that have flourished because Lee is, you know, you know, so you can look at it, you can look at it a number of ways, but, but, um, 
look, he, he's made a decision and he's gone. So it's, 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 it's not, you know, if you're Roshi Mullen, you can keep going on and on and on and on, you know. Um, and, and yeah, every team, like, like me over the last five years, the amount of players that, that, that they've lost. And a lot of those players, in theory, I think I've said this before, could have, could have played another year. No, no, no question about it. But there, there, there comes a time and, you know, they can feel, the player feels themselves when they're, I think John, Johnny was saying there, you get a couple of knocks and bangs, hard to recover. You're not yourself. So you're in Croker. Like Lee might be, in, say, to take that example, might be in Croker this year and not, just can't get to the level he was last year and then gets a gets a bad doing from a young up and coming player. You know, so all that factors into their in, in, into their decision. So look, time, 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 time moves on, you know. Morris, how did you not know about this? You're a GA reporter in the country, finger on the pulse. How did you not know about it? I'm obviously not a very good GA reporter. Um, I don't know. It's, I think the mechanics of how they kept under wraps are kind of amazing. Like it's absolutely incredible that. There seems to be no word of this anywhere. Um, but Paul, just to circle back to something you said there, I think you have to, you can't, like we're not in a good spot to adjudicate whether or not the, it, what stuff might seem inconsequentially, but is very significant, the impact it would have on a squad if you bring a guy back, like, like what it would do to people's mentality, what it would say to the players that James just mentioned there, if a guy who hasn't been around for an entire preseason and hasn't put the yards is suddenly parachuted in and is playing ahead of them. I think that's, that is not an insignificant factor within all this. So if you're bringing a guy back, you have to set him on, it has to be a role. Like has to be, the best example of this that I can think of this century probably is Mike McCarthy for Kerry. Mike McCarthy, yeah. Had, a, had an absolute, Kerry had a big problem at centre back and they went and found a, a perfect solution. Whereas you look at maybe on the flip side of that, Paul Gallman came back and there wasn't a, a specific role from there. And maybe they didn't get the lift that they anticipated from that. And I wonder to what extent, how it impacted the squad just beyond that as well. But just to your point, this is what Dublin do. They, they drop their stuff in very seamlessly. It's part of the, the organization. So uh, it is. A, it was a total and utter surprise. And I mean, Johnny mentioned that he started laughing. You don't want to hear what the talk of the press box, the noise in the press box. It was like a pack of hyenas when we saw him come up on the screen. But um, the it is also very kind of understandable. It's predictable in a sense that Dublin managed to keep this under wraps. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm just appalled. A couple of weeks ago. I was in in the upstairs bar of Kills talking to a guy from another Dublin club, uh, not Cluxton's club, who asked me a very pointed question if I'd heard whether Stephen Cluxton was back in for Dublin, and I I kind of laughed at it and didn't go on, and I'm 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 so disappointed with myself. But he asked me again about forty minutes later. In other words, did I did I know did I know? And he was basically telling me without knowing me and and oh, so, Mr. Scoop man. Mr. Scoop, I am absolutely disgusted with myself. Oh. Absolutely disgusted. Not even um, a late show researcher could find yeah. that yeah, yeah. You're, you're threatening your card here. It's not helping Morris. <laughs> not helping. Um we we Dublin were kind of comfortable against Loud without being terribly impressive. We'll be talking about Dublin again in in the next couple of weeks in division three Fermanagh, again, an outstanding achievement. We're going to talk about Fermanagh over the next couple of weeks as well. But I want to talk about Division 4. Um, I I got a text from the Wicklow manager last night who wanted to know <laughs> was there going to be a full show devoted to not just Wicklow, but also him. I think we need a full podcast series on uh, what Oshin has done in Wicklow. And all joking aside, uh, I, I, I admire what he's done there to come in and after the first two games, when a, a, a draw with Carlo and a loss to Sligo, and you're thinking this is going to be a fairly, fairly long spring, I'm finding this really hard to give that man a compliment. But, uh, but, but fair, fair play to to Wicklow for for getting ahead of Watford at the end of the day and getting promoted. But the game of the weekend, Sligo Leitrim, in um, in the Division Four decider, Johnny, like to, to, what what a game to win for Sligo. Yeah. Yeah, unbelievable uh, win, and by all accounts, a uh, tremendous game as well. Like the the crowd on each room really got into it. It's a great um, place to play football, isn't it? It's a great, it's a great ground. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, look, we, we I've played a few uh, league games down there down through the years in middle of February and and March, and uh, yeah, it's not it, not it's great nice ground, Johnny, nice. right? Uh, it's not it's not the prettiest place to be, like especially when oh, it's, it's, uh, a heavy when it's pitch close. Ball, if you ran it, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but no, uh, you know, like I was encouraged with a few lads from Leitrim as well, like, and they're unbelievably passionate about their 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 county, like the football especially. And uh, to me, Andy Moore is doing a great job there. Uh, I know they didn't get promoted, but there's definitely you can see um, big improvements. I think far more organised uh, in their systems of play, like uh, getting the best out of Keith Byrne. I think they were unlucky with injuries there this year as well, but they just came up short against Sligo, who are definitely improving as well. Like Sligo are a good side. We've I don't know, I've played Sligo, I don't know how many times, to be honest, because uh, they're typically, they were in Division 3 when we were, so, um, look, unbelievable win for Sligo to get out of Division 4, because it's not easy anymore, the standards after evening out a lot, like, um, a lot of Division 4 teams would be mid-Division 3 standard, like, there's not a whole lot between them, like, last year in the Talton Cup, we played Wexford and Wicklow, like, and, do you know, the, we were, I suppose, coming down from Division 2, and uh, both those teams probably, every bit as good as a lot of teams in Division 3 or not much between them anyway. Like, it's all on a given year how organised you are, what personnel you have. Have you avoided player turnover? Like, have you got a good pre-season? Has everyone got pre-season? The right players especially. And, um, yeah, look, unlucky for Leitrim with the, the, the hopefully, if I if I were the, them, I'd be pressing for Andy Moore to stay because you can see improvements. And uh, I know it's a championship to come, but in terms of, like, going forward for them, like, you know, uh, they're definitely making strides and in Sligo they need to get back up the, to Division 3 and I suppose to, to push on from there as I was saying earlier to the, to the lads there um, for the teams lower down it's all about seeing progress like otherwise you won't hang around like so um, It's interesting great. though there's more than progress at stake here though isn't there because one of these two teams with with okay London might turn something around in the next couple of weeks but one of these two teams is going to be in the Sam Maguire competition because mm-hmm. one of them is going to make a, a Connacht final yeah, yeah, and they're going to be risky. Looks like playing one another, but that game now will even be more tasty if you know what I mean. Because yeah, be uh, brilliant. Yeah, because by all accounts, Leitrim could have won yesterday. So like Leitrim are going to go in there with I suppose two things: knowing that they can win and two a point to prove. And then Sligo kind of have to back up what they've already done. They can't do the same thing again. You know, to be analysis, everyone will be aware of what the other team did in the last game. Like so, there'll be a lot of dynamics there that we won't even be aware of. Like without seeing that game, you know? Um, so, yeah, that would be probably, that, that could be one of the, one of the, one of the games of the championship, you could actually say, like, because when you get two teams at a similar level playing, like, the entertainment factor is always, it doesn't matter, like, the standard is good, like, it's inter-county football, like, the entertainment factor is going to be there, like, so that would be a game I, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for. Just, just on that, yeah, and I, I agree completely, Johnny, I, I, I think, when they if they meet in the championship, gee, that's definitely a game to go to. That will be um, um, that'll be huge for 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 both teams because 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 what it brings. So so um, but yeah, and Andy would disappoint. But but I heard him y- yesterday. I, Paul, we might touch on this again. If Leitrim did win yesterday, that you know they'd be playing that on the Saturday or Sunday or whatever next weekend and then the yeah, following next Saturday evening it was meant yeah to be, the yeah. following Thursday they'd be heading to New York for, for 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 the championship like if you just think of the mechanics of that and I've been I've been in that situation going to going on that New York trip with with the team a couple of times it's a nightmare for a start um pre you know for, for championship and everything that there's events organized around and there's everything else but you've guys that have played a long league campaign there's some of them a lot of them have played Sigerson um, a lot of them are working, um, all that kind of stuff. And then you got to turn around and go straight into a championship. You're flying, you know, across to, to America to, 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 to play a game and then come back and, and, and into championship. It's, it is insane. And I heard Andy after the game yesterday and he, he was, he was livid with, with, with the expectations of players. And I, I couldn't agree with him more, you know, um, uh, it's, it's very unfair what's expected of players. Now the condensed season and everything else has been, it is what it is. It's it's. I, I'm still not convinced it's it's the right format. But that's again, that's for another day. But there's an expectation of players now, or, or not even expectation. People don't even consult the players. It just the structures put in, dates are put in, and just go go with it. So I think it's unfair at the moment what's expected players. There was all this burnout discussion. Do you remember a couple of years ago? There was everyone yeah. was going to cry to a halt and what these unfair managers were doing doing to players and all this kind of stuff. And what did we do? We came up with this split season format that rams the competitions on top of each, you know, almost three competitions on top of each other at the one time, the Provincials, the Sigerson, and the Nash Star for the National League. And we go straight into that, straight into a championship, and then go straight from that, straight into, straight into a club. So uh, to me, there's going to be 
a lot of fall off, a lot of injuries, um, a lot of players just saying just can't keep up that that hectic schedule. So I, I think there's there's a lot that's needed there. So so just when Andy said it, I, I think it, it it definitely weren't. So so he has a point, and we're we he does have a point, and we're going to come back to this. Against that, we have heard a lot of players coming out and saying they like the split season because they can concentrate on their county and then on their club. I think the change has to be within the nature of the games that are within the inter county window and how the competitions are organised. What I will say, though, and I do, I don't want to be trite about this, and I do take Andy's point, but if somebody told me I was playing in Croke Park on a Sunday afternoon and then flying to New York on the Thursday, I think I'd take it as a way to spend a few days. Sure, sure, but your employers might have something different to say as well. Yeah, true, true. You know, there there is a lot of, there's a lot of implications, like going on a Thursday, you know, means you have to train, you are probably trying you, you know, train or get together, get all. Look at all I'm saying, Paul. Based on my experience, there's a huge amount to it, and it's, it's tough on players. And they're away for four or five days, then and back, and they probably have to miss a few days from the following week of their work and that kind of stuff. So, we we, we just need to think through it. I don't think it continues as it is. The particularly the the, the start of seasons, what well, the way it is. No, no, I I agree. I agree. There's it's too condensed in terms of what the, what the expectations are. I have no no argument about this. What I will say, Morris is. I don't think there should be league finals. I don't think. Yeah. I think a league is a league. I, I think this weekend should be just a free weekend for everybody. That that's a, a realistic solution purely because that's the elephant in the room here is the provincial system. It could totally. We're just talking about Kerry having four weeks off now before their next game. They're going off to a training camp over the Easter holidays. Mayo are looking at. Mayo try to. It looks like it's going to be confirmed later that the request to move the league final to Saturday is going to be denied. So they're going to be out on Sunday and then they're out in the championship first rounder. A week after this is the elephant in the room is that for all this nice shiny new shiny new structure we have the provincial structure is a total impediment to any sort of realistic calendar where you could have a equitable system where teams have a equal gap between games so until we fix that we're, yeah. we're going in circles can i just make one one small point the last time leitrim went to new york they were blessed to escape with a yeah. win and they spent a lot of time I think they had to go to Ballyhonest, James. They trained on the 3G pitch there to, yeah. to get ready for the surface. They don't have the, the opportunity to do that now because of how close this game is going to be against New York. The, the strongest I've seen New York from watching them play over the last few years was against Sligo last year. And you add in the fact that it, it sounds like you're hearing all sorts of whispers about this. We don't know, but it sounds like they have the same squad that they had last year. Plus, they've thrown in the likes of Musher or Gavin O'Brien from, from Kerry as well. That's not an easy game for Leitrim to come to bounce back up. To, I know... We're all getting excited about uh, Leitrim Sligo rematch. They have to get over that first. Like that'll be that'll be a huge test for them. And they don't have, as we just mentioned, they don't have a big window to prepare for it. So, um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, Paul, get rid of league finals. Sure, I, I'd have no issue with that. But that it's it's a realistic solution because the, the the proper solution is not attainable, and that's getting rid of the provincial system. Yeah, but when you think about it, right, the discussion for Mayo and Kerry and all the top teams over the last number of months is. Is to avoid a league final, <laughs> but that's crazy. The league is yeah. a brilliant, brilliant competition. It's an absolutely brilliant competition. I agree. Yeah, and, I agree. But yet, halfway through it, your teams are almost thinking of pulling on the brakes because they don't want to get to the final and win the competition. Like, so we, we, we've created a situation that just doesn't make any any sense, you know. So, so uh, definitely, league final is one. I think there's a couple of weeks that can be squeezed, you, you know, in between Sigerson League get rid of league finals. So there's two or three different options there that just give you a couple of weeks. Yes. That's probably enough for, you know, because um, to, to give teams that, you know, everyone a fair, a fair crack at it. I, I agree with your point. I agree, James, I agree with your point on the league final. Um, you know, people not wanting to be there. And that's why I say no final, but win the league in a straight out way. So you don't have to play a team twice. Like does Derry, do, if you were Derry or Dublin, does, does, how are you approaching next weekend? How big of a game is, is it for you if you're Derry and Dublin? Uh, well, for Derry, for Derry getting the, getting the national title in Crow Park, beating Dublin Crow Park is absolute. That's, that's, that's huge for your building. It's, it's part of the whole building process. And you, it, I'm, I'm sure, the Royal will build it that way, you know. So, so that that is an important one. I'm not sure when Jerry are out in their in, in their championship. Um, I, I don't know how long of a break they have, but but no, that's that's still a huge game. And and for Dublin as well, it's a, it, it it is a big big game, you know. Beating Derry and Croker and Rice, where we're we're fully lined up now. We're all pointing their own way, and away you go. You can kickstart your your, your season, you know. And you asked me earlier on, didn't get a chance with the Mayo Galway one. It's sort of similar. That's. The two of them, you 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 can pick it up from Boric Joyce. Um, you know, he, he yesterday how long it's been since going won a national, da, 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 all that kind of stuff. So he's 
he he's absolutely gunning for that. And it's it's funny, it's a big game for Mayo as well. Mayo have been excellent, uh, well above the majority of teams in, in in the national league. And yeah, Monaghan is easily explained away and, and all that, but it's 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 still a defeat. You know, Mayo go into a, a, a league final. The last thing you want to do is lose to go in in in, in Crow Park in the national final. So yeah. The way it's, it's it's led up, and the four teams that are in Division One, Division Two finals, they're they're going to be cracking. They're going to be cracking encounters that are important for all the teams involved. I think it's a big game for Mayo, and I was looking at, and I, I do agree, Mayo have had a good league, but I think there are two warning signs for from Mayo, um, not closing out the day against Armagh, and the amount of scores they're conceding. Like I, I, Morris might correct me on the facts here, but I think they're conceding the guts of fifteen points a match, and that's. That's fairly significant in 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 this time of year. Now they're playing very open, free form football. It's very good to see, but I'm not. I that would worry me a little bit. So I can't wait to see them next Sunday in in in, in Crow Park. I'm really looking forward. Um, I'm really looking forward to that game. Um, thank you, lads, for for coming in, uh, for joining us today. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Johnny, uh, James. Thank you. Thanks, to William Morris. Thanks to Larry Ryan for running the podcast. To Raf Rocca to Jack Neville, to Tony Lean, and to everyone at um, Examiner Sport. Thanks to Allianz for their support. Uh, Bémé Tarnash Galua. Come on, Mayo, you've got to get Andy Moran into the game. This 